So to become an Olympian in any sport is an amazing achievement. And this evening, Rowan is going to tell us how that is done. So Rowan, can I invite you to talk about becoming an Olympian? And Patricia, you're going to share the screen, I think. There we go. And did you want to mute everyone? Oh, yes, I haven't done that, have I? And, and can you see the screen? Let me just make sure you can oh, see you, the you've gone off the, Your screen's gone off. Hold on. The screen's good. That's it now. You're right now, Trish. And yeah, the screen's good. Well, good, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Gordon, for inviting me to speak to the Rotary Group in Bishop Stortford. I'm here to talk to you about my rowing career and how I managed to row at the Olympic Games in Tokyo. It's been quite a journey for me. I honestly never knew if I would get there. It was in Scotland that I started to row. I lived there till I was 10 years old and I rowed on the canal in Edinburgh. My parents rowed as well and had both rowed in the Commonwealth Games. Uh, this is a picture of me, age nine, and my dad rowing in an event in Glasgow on the River Clyde. The event was called the Generation Doubles. We didn't win, but I think I might still be the youngest person to ever have competed in the event. Um, in 2004, we came down to Hertfordshire and my dad made sure we bought a house no more than 15 minutes from a rowing club. We joined Broxbourne Rowing Club, where we rowed on the River Lee. It was a great place to learn to row and the volunteer coaches were very supportive and helped me with training programmes and water work. I competed on my own and with other girls in the club including my sister. We are both in the boat here. She's at the front. In my last year in school, I trialed for the GB junior team. It was quite daunting as I hadn't done anything like that before. I did get through some rounds, but I wasn't successful in making the team. At that time, I didn't treat this as a defeat. I knew I could do better. and I wanted to continue to row in some form. I decided to apply for university in America. I was lucky enough to gain a full rowing scholarship to the University of California, Berkeley, which was a bit of a dream come true. We were picked up every day from our accommodation at 5.30 a.m. and driven to a beautiful lake in the mountains behind Berkeley. After a couple of hours rowing, we would come back for breakfast before going to class. Uh, during the day, we had to fit in land training on the rowing machine. Uh, the scholar athletes have to work hard in their studies and their sport. If you fall behind in your academic work, you're suspended from rowing. So I had to keep both going all the time if I wanted to stay on the team. At Cal, I learned how to train really hard and I saw a huge improvement in my rowing. By my second year, I was in the first boat and in my third year, we won the national collegiate championships. This was a huge honor for the team and for the university. In my final year, I was made captain, which gave me responsibility on top of my rowing and academic work. During the summer holidays, when I came home, I made the GB under 23 team twice. And in 2015, I won a silver medal in the pair. This was my first international race. So it was a real achievement for me at the time. Um, I graduated in 2017. And when I came home, I was invited to join the senior uh, team training at the National Rowing Lake in Caversham. I was now committing to a full-time career in rowing. I moved near to the lake and was now training three times a day. It's a combination of rowing outings, weights, and never ending sessions on the rowing machine. This is one of the hardest aspects of being in the squad as a readout shows exactly how your scores, scores compare to your fellow athletes. It's one of the metrics your coaches will use to decide this, the crews so you can't afford to have a bad score. We also train in different combinations of people on the water. The coaches are looking for rowers who can both move a boat well and can work with others in the crew. Over the course of the year, there are a number of trials which we have to attend. After the final trials, crews are put together and we have a number um, of races in the summer before the World Championships in September. Each year I've managed to get into the crews for the World Championships. And in 2019, I was in the eight that qualified the boat for the Olympics the following year. 
However, qualifying the boat is one thing. You still have to earn your place in the boat over the course of the next year. In March 2020, <clears throat> in the final trials, I was the top athlete in my discipline. The Olympic team was announced and I was delighted to be in the women's four, which would be the top women's boat. I don't need to tell anyone what came next. When the pandemic hit and the first lockdown was announced, the team were sent home with nothing but a rowing machine. For the first week or so, we thought the Olympics were still going to go ahead. We hoped against hope that would be the case. But then a week later, they were postponed to the following year. The boats were deselected and we were back to square one. We were all fighting for our place again. I spent lockdown at my parents' house in Little Berkhamstead. I'll be honest, I struggled during the first lockdown, like a lot of people, and maybe like some of you. I was strong on rowing technique and rowing in the boat, but the rowing machine all the time was difficult and mentally it wasn't easy. I was at home with my parents and they helped by training with me as much as they could. So it was overall very positive compared to what many other people went through. And thankfully it was a sunny summer. In September, we came back together as a team and started the recovery program to get back to full strength. Each of us were bringing ourselves back slowly and by December, I'd managed to come back stronger, but it was a huge workload. Going into 2022, and getting ready for Tokyo, we were doing more land testing than racing. Everyone was back in the game and we were all fighting for those seats again. Building up to every trial was, was really hard and competing against one another was extremely stressful. Thankfully, I managed to win my seat again, along with one other girl who had been in the four the year before. However, the two others who had been selected the previous year were moved out into different boats. In other boats, some girls who had been previously selected were not in the team at all this year. Because of COVID, there had been very little international competition. We had one event before the Olympics, which was the European Championships. This was our first race for two years. Because it was only Europe, we were missing some of the big Olympic nations like Australia and the USA. The Dutch took an early lead. However, we had a good race with the Irish for a large part of the race. They moved through us in the final um, stages of the race, so we knew we had some work to do to catch them before the Olympics. Is my door? I'll leave it. Um, um, we stayed in a pre-Olympic hotel where we were quarantined and could see no one outside the team. When we left the hotel for the airport, some parents came to the car park to watch us get, up, get onto the bus. They hadn't seen us for months in case we caught COVID and they couldn't risk coming over to give us a hug. And of course, they weren't coming to Tokyo. So this was their chance to wish us good luck before we left. And then we hit Tokyo. Remember, this was the event I'd been looking forward to for so long. I'm sure you saw London and Rio on the TV. And if you remember the crowds, well, it was totally different in Tokyo. Uh, the Japanese volunteers did an amazing job to make it feel special, but even they couldn't hide that we weren't allowed to leave the Olympic Village or have our families watch us. My parents came, uh, come to every competition, so it was really sad for me that they, were, they weren't able to come to the Olympics. Within the Olympic Village, we were restrict, restricted to our own accommodation. I could only leave to go rowing or to eat. The place where you ate was like a series of clear booths on the tables. You could see people, but not really communicate. There was a lot of stress and anxiety as well, because every day we were doing COVID tests. The worry being, if one of us in the crew got COVID, we'd all be banned from racing. We went into the first race with a little bit of confidence. We'd managed to do some racing while other nations hadn't done any. However, we messed up our heat coming in fourth, meaning we, we wouldn't progress straight to the final. Suddenly we were plunged into self-doubt and we, um, we knew everything rested on our repechage race. This is basically the last chance saloon race for those who didn't qualify in the heats. There's usually a day's break between the heat and the repechage in order to recover. But there were weather reports of an incoming typhoon. So we had, a, um, so we had to race the following morning at about 7.30 a.m. Thankfully, we had a much better race and made it to the final. 
This was a real big confidence booster. So thank the Lord for the typhoon. The final was very intense. Um, I'm at bow, uh, in the boat, so and I steer with my foot. So an added stress for me, especially as there was a crosswind all week. In the race, the Aussies and the Dutch were almost guaranteed the gold and silver. Therefore, in order to win the bronze medal, we would have to beat the Irish, who had beaten us at Europeans. We were totally focused on the third position, on that bronze medal position. Until the last 200 meters of the race, we were sitting in bronze medal position when the Irish came up beside us and started to edge past. We ended up coming in fourth, missing out on the bronze by a tiny margin. We were disappointed, but we rode the best we'd rode all season and we had a great race and gave it everything we could. There were still lots of things that made the Olympic experience unique. I'd waited my whole life to go to the Olympic Village and wanted to make the most of the little time we had. Um, we, were given, um, we were all given Union Jack pins that we could swap at a distance with other athletes. I doubt anyone managed um, to collect as many as I did. I also became a stamp collector for the week. I spent a fortune on Olympic stamps. Um, and we had to be on a plane within 24 hours of our event finishing. So we didn't have long to explore the village. However, each team had things with their, from their own nationalities to make them feel at home. The British had a telephone box and a fleet of Brompton bikes. I think I spent probably most of that 24 hours um, after my event riding around on a Brompton bike. But my rowing career didn't stop there. I made the decision to carry on rowing and I've set my sights for Paris 2024 which we're all hoping will be a more complete experience than it was in Tokyo. This year, I was once again selected for the top boat, the women's four. And this year we were unbeaten. We won two World Cups, the European Championships and the World Championships. Um, this is a photo of us crossing the line at the World Championships in September. When I came back after the Worlds, I, was, I dropped in on Broxbourne. Um, it helps me reflect that rowing has given me so much in life, and although I have to give up other aspects of life that most people find very normal, I wouldn't have it any other way. Rowing has given me so much fitness, so much more than fitness, strength and racing. There are so many things I've learned or gained along the way. I've had to have stamina and resilience to keep going in the face of adversity, injury, defeat and illness. You just have to pick yourself up and get back in the game. You can't wallow in self-pity. You have to draw on your inner strength so many times and not let anything get in your way. I've also learned about teamwork and how you need to be able to rely on your crew and they have to rely on you. You are part of a whole, not something working against the others. It's something we have to work on as we compete against one another to get into boats and then we have to work with one another to win the race. These are things I will take throughout my life and I'll always be able to draw on. Thank you. Um, is there any questions? Thanks, Ron. I think you forgot to mention the Sunday Times, did you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, my crew from this year has um, been uh, selected among uh, a few other teams to be uh, the team of the year for the Sunday, uh, Sunday Times. If, if anyone wants to um, give us a vote. <laughs> It's called self-promoting, I think. <laughs> we will um, circulate uh, the voting details to everyone here. And, and oh, thank you. have not been able to join as well. Thanks. Um, and good luck with that. Right, any questions? Noel. You'll need to unmute, Noel. Now, there are basically two types of racing. There are those on rivers where you follow the stream and follow the, uh, you know, like the boat race and things like that. And those in large lakes where, where you've got a large number of teams side by side. Um, which of those two do you prefer? Um, I definitely prefer the side by side. Right. Um, I've done sort of head races along the river, which have been really fun, 
I think it's a bit to do with they're usually in the winter and so they're usually a bit cold and um, quite long and you're sort of on your own in the middle of the river just trying as hard as you can to get down there but when you've got the side by side you've got people either side of you that you're pushing against the whole way down and it's usually in the summer and <laughs> um, yeah so I definitely think side by side is um, is preferable for me. I suppose Henley is really just about side by side, even though you don't do side yeah, by Hen side. Henley is side by side, but add about 10 times intensity. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, any other questions? I could go to no, Peter, you're muted. It always interests me when you see the races, which we obviously have to do on television, and you're all virtually neck neck and neck, and then somebody starts edging ahead. How long does it really take you as a team to appreciate that and sort of up your game to try and uh, get back on terms and overtake? It's, it's not something that happens in a few yards it, it sometimes seems to take 100 meters or something like that yeah i think um definitely this year was the first crew i'd been in um i think it was is a little bit to do with the training program that helped us do this but we sort of completely focused on the middle thousand meters of the race mm. and we were just focused on edging a minute amount each stroke and we knew it it does not it never happens in just two or three strokes it takes the whole thousand meters to get the distance that you're looking for and it's a little I mean a lot of it's confidence we had conf this year especially we had so much confidence that in that middle section of the race we were eventually if someone was staying with us they were pushing too hard or if we were um down on someone you know we were exactly where we wanted to be and exactly on our pace so we had to have confidence that we would eventually come through by the end you didn't need to win the first 500 meters you need to win no. the the end of the race but yeah it, it it's um it's a horrible feeling thinking oh god they've just blasted off and we won't see them again you have to really believe we'll reel them in we'll reel them in and eventually we'll we'll start walking through them um is it possible you, when you get alongside, you really feel you can judge it at that point? Because yeah. so many of these races seem to be won by, well, like only a few feet, you know, the, the gong, gong goes boom, boom, you know. Yeah. So it must be terribly difficult to know exactly where you are in relation. Yeah, I think um, when it's those kind of races where it's <clears throat> right at the end I think that's just a case of holding on for dear life in the last 20 strokes basically you're, yeah. you've probably been neck and neck the whole way down and it's more who who can hold it together in the last 100 meters um yeah I'd say an intense feeling when you actually beat them at the last yeah fantastic well done thank you very much thanks I think there's a question from your aunt <laughs> me um, That's right. Rowan, Rowan, you talk you talk this year of having more confidence. Where has that conf confidence come from that's led to these successes this year? I'm sorry, the dog where I can't prevent the, the dog. dog's making a noise. <laughs> um, I think it's definitely come from the training. I think I've never um, had the confidence that my legs are going to be able to just repeat, 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 repeat through that middle part of the race um it's always been oh my god we're halfway and now I have to hang on till the end that's every, like that's generally how I've I've felt and sort of thought this is how I'm supposed to feel I've got to yeah so has, has there been a difference in your training this time around or a difference yes we structure? yeah actually um we got um a new coach came in in um, February and he he actually showed us a graph yesterday of um difference in training and you could see and it was just throughout the, our year and he came in in February and you didn't have to look you didn't have to look carefully at all you could see the the week he arrived 
our, this, the charts were sort of this and then suddenly he arrived and then it was just all a lot higher than we had been doing. So this year that made a complete difference for the whole team. The whole women's team um, uh, performed a lot better and it just, it just showed really, really easily. Thank you. Uh, Will Gemmell? Uh, Brian, uh, Premier Boat it is fantastic in the, in the four. Uh, and it, you sort of answered it, but it, it sounds like in Tokyo, you came fourth, credible fourth, but it, you're number one in the world. Do I get that at the moment? The four is the best. So the bit, the big difference is just the change, change of, has there been change of personnel or was it just change of training? Yeah, so we did have um, the two of us who were in, um, I was saying that two of us made it in the um, COVID year and then two of us continued into the Olympic year. The same two of us continued in this year, um, but we got two new girls in. So half the boat was the same as the Olympic boat um, with two um, so younger girls who had who'd been training full time, but not with the team last year. Um, and they were just, I mean, our crew gelled well and that Rebecca and I had a bit more experience and the other two came in, they were a bit younger and they were just like absolutely loving being on the team, brought that sort of enthusiasm back in. And um, it, that they, I mean, they're also just, they're just great athletes, but that, that did also help the crew in general. And can I ask you just one other question as a middle-aged man who goes on the rowing machine in the gym and tries to row 2000 meters as fast as possible. What time does an Olympic champion or will be Olympic champion, I've no doubt in Paris, uh, row 2000 meters in oh. on a rowing machine in the gym? Well, my personal best is 647. Oh, my word. Um, yeah. That's, Very that's good. Cool. There is another I'm gonna, question. I'm going to keep working at that then. <laughs> so what, well, what is your time? I, <laughs> I can get under eight minutes, but I'd probably be about 7.50 or something. So I'm a minute behind. <laughs> well done. Right, any other questions? Yeah, Irene. You need to unmute, Irene. Good evening, Ron. It's been fascinating listening to that. Can I ask what... What made you choose to be in a four? Because you can obviously row in other combinations. Did you specifically decide that that was what you wanted to do? Um, no, I basically, we basically, as athletes, we don't have much per se. Um, the ranking of the boats can change each year. Um, if there's a, we, we test in pairs. So um, in, in, it could be a pair as the top boat. Um, this um, for the last two years, it's gone the four, the pair, and then an eight. But um, in previous years, we've had the eight as the top boat. So I I really enjoy the four. I think it's a really good. It's I feel like the pair is quite intense. It's just the two of you. You know, it's that's a lot of time just the two of you together. And the eight, there's there's a lot of people to try and bring together and try to everyone keep getting on. And and it's it's. I think that eight and eight is quite hard work, whereas I think a four is just a perfect combination, um, in my opinion, of people, um, of people on the boat. So I'm really happy that the four has been the been the top boat the last couple of years. But in in any other year, it could be it could be completely different. We're just told, and we just go where we're told, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but I can I can see your logic about the four. It's the kind of compromise between too much stress with two and a lot of people to bring together yeah. with, with eight um, but you got a silver medal in the eight i think in the europeans right yeah um in in um 2019 yeah and when that year the eight was the top boat um because in in qualifying year in qualifying year things um all change a little bit because it's there's a different number so only five eights will qualify for the olympics but nine pairs will. So you sometimes are quite strategic with that because we could probably have a one of our lower pairs could still come in the top nine, whereas our lowest eight might not come in the top five. So um, that's that's the come year coming up. So we'll see what the coaches coaches decide to do. Um, but I've actually yeah, I've raced in all boats at the world champ or a pair for and an eight at the world championship. So. Um, 
Fantastic. Any other questions? Hey, Michael. Oh. Hi, hi, Rowan. Um, rowing is one of those sports where when you're winning, you can look directly at the people you're beating rather than a running sport where you have to look behind you. What's more satisfying when you're in that winning position? Is it a job well done or the fact that you're dominating your opposition? Um, I think it kind of depends on the event. Um, I think, for example, um, at Henley this year, we we um, well, obviously really wanted to win. Uh, we were in an eight this year for Henley. Just that was just our, our what the coaches decided for Henley, and we were we were down on the Australians who we we just really wanted to beat the Australians and um and we walked through them about halfway and that was um just pure pleasure in, in dominating the the Aussies in that race whereas at Worlds it was a little bit of Worlds was complete relief we had had this amazing season and it was we'd gone through all those rounds still of 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 being sort of the favorites and that was more just oh thank god we've pulled it off you know it was rather than you know haha we've beaten you it was more of a um a relief for worlds okay well Ron, when you start a race do you have a plan of what the stroke speed is to be um yeah we do we um we'll practice that uh, throughout the year um it kind of it a little bit depends on the uh, way the wind's blowing um and it, but it'll usually be within a pip or two it, it's it never varies hugely um but we have we have a very clear plan race plan and a very clear um rhythm that we look for but well, at least this you know in the four, in my boats, we have a very have had a very clear rhythm that we're looking for going um, off the start and to get into that middle K. And um, as I was saying, that that K in the middle is where we were focused entirely all year, and it was all about getting onto the rhythm that was going to take us through that K. Um, and 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 essentially, the first five hundred was just about finding that rhythm. And as soon as we were on it, then it was like, okay, we're just we're staying here for the next thousand meters. We're not doing any heroics here. We're we're right in our rhythm and on our stroke rate. And this is where we're gonna stay for the next thousand meters, basically. And if you're just behind in the last quarter, will you increase your stroke rate? Yeah. 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 I mean, even if we're up, we'll increase our stroke stroke rate because everyone will be increasing their stroke rate. Um in the last 500, it well, really in the last 750, it was um, incremental steps in rate and in speed um, to have a sprint finish. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's an incredible commitment. Any other questions? Ron, well, that was, uh, you've had an amazing journey. Have you been picked yet for Paris or is that yet to be decided? No, no. long way off. Um, we'll we'll have the trials again this year for this year's World Championships, and then um, it'll be Olympic year after that. So that's twenty twenty four. Yeah. Olympic years. Has your has your parents booked their flights yet? I hope not. <laughs> we we can't book anything. So we can't jinx anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll definitely want to be there, but we don't want to. You know, and nothing that we do will <laughs> retract from it. Um, One, I, I just want. I wonder if Rowan wanted to say a little bit about what she has to give up as well, because I mean, you're right in terms of family going to watch, but you know, she has, uh, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't get to many family events or anything like that because she's always training, you know, and uh, that's, that's quite a hard side of it as well. You know, you've missed quite a lot of, I don't know, weddings and yep. things and birthdays and all these kind of things. So it's quite, uh, it's, you have to be quite dedicated. Yeah, it's very um, inflexible. Um, we can't book book our time off. We get given um, three weeks after the World Championships. And we get a few days at Christmas, um, and that's sort of it throughout the year. So, <clears throat> trying to 
beg for a Saturday off to go to your sister's wedding is is sort of what the the system is but we just we sort of have to um in order to to get all the training in and is that the same for all olympic sport um i'm not sure i i mean i don't think so i think rowing is um is particularly i mean i'm sure it's i think the endurance sports are all pretty similar like long distance running you you just have to put the um time in and that's where the results will come basically you can't just you can't skip steps to get to the end you have to make sure you're doing them all and the the training the co- the coaching is quite important i presume it's... yeah yeah we have um a good set of coaches um this year has been a, a big change and uh, everyone's just really happy with the new head coach uh, this year. My lasting, my uh, my memory of uh, 212, <clears throat> when I think it was the Coxless who came second, would that be right, in 212? Um, in the men? Ladies, I think. There wasn't one. Oh, the eight. The eight came eight. second. I know, I know <laughs> the team were, were distraught that they were second. <laughs> the sheer determination to win, which I presume you must have. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, I think you wouldn't put in the hours if you weren't going there to win. Rather than you don't you don't go there just to try and make the final. You're there to to get a medal, basically. Yeah. What's the total number of the squad of the whole rowing squad for UK? Um, it it varies a bit. Usually, um, usually in the high teens. Oh, for the women anyway a yeah. few more we usually there's usually the men's team's a bit bigger but yeah you may around 20. so that's a lot of very dedicated young women which yeah is <laughs> so where are you just now Ron? um i'm just at home in, in reading so just about 10 oh, minutes right. from the lake oh, i see okay ready for training tomorrow <laughs> yeah. morning at half five <laughs> Can I just ask, is that a new lake in Reading? Because I no. grew up in Caversham and I don't remember a rowing lake in the area. Um, it will be quite new. They didn't, um, they wouldn't have started training there until the 2000s. Um, I'm, yeah, I think it is. It, I mean, I'm sure the lake was there, but the boathouse um, wasn't. They We trained, they the older teams train in Marlow mm. on the river stretch where we, we do go to quite often, but there is now a 2K, um, two, like a self-contained 2K lake uh, in, in Caversham. Interesting. <laughs> okay, Eddie? Yeah, oh, Gordon, yeah. Can, I, can I ask this? Just on, um, Ryan, in terms of um, calories you burn, in a uh, in a day uh how much what how much you have to eat in order to keep the stamina up and also drug testing being an olympic athlete how often do they um test you for drugs well okay um the eating you're not you're not short on food at any point we have we ha- get up and have breakfast go for a row have second breakfast go for a row have lunch do weights, have a snack, have dinner. I mean, we're on food every couple of hours throughout the day and like a full a full meal every couple of hours. Um, and with the drug testing, I mean, it kind of depends. Um, I've been quite unfortunate in that I got drug tested straight after the World Championship final and straight after the Olympic final, um, which is a bit of a shame because everyone's um, wanting to celebrate and I'm off in the drug testers um, place. And they, they'll come to your house and they come to training. Um, but it's quite random. I mean, they're there, they'll sometimes come three days in a row and then we won't see them for, for two months. So, um, but sometimes they'll come every couple of weeks. It, it, I mean, obviously it's random, that's, that's the point. But um, yeah, you just, you just never know. Yeah. But you don't have to count calories per se. You, you're not there to say you're to take 3,000 calories or 5,000. No. I mean, we get the meals. We can't have the meals provided at Caversham. So 
you sort of know if they're eating what they're providing you with you're eating enough um but they're not i mean unless you're specifically trying to gain or lose weight they they you're not usually restricted in your diet in any way i mean you just make sure you get get the food in there basically you obviously take energy drinks i think don't you are you yeah. giving very strong guidance as to which ones are okay and which ones yeah are? yeah very um there's different there's basically one or two uh, makes that we are um advised to have and even and within those we're still advised to check the batch number and write down the batch number just in case anything from those has been contaminated with um with something from a factory that it might have been made in uh, but yeah there everyone has to be quite careful with that okay michael did you have another question no i thought your hand was up i was just going to answer your um your colleague's question about the cavish and rowing lake which was built in built in the late 90s when Jürgen Grobler had enough of boats being broken at Leander Club for the men's training squad. He had a hissy fit and they found an old quarry outside Caversham and built the rowing lake. It's only like four lanes wide, I think. All right. So it's there, is it? So it's near it, Sonny. It, it's, a, it's got a straight one side and it's all higgledy piggledy on the other side. You can see it as you come into Reading train station from London on the right hand side. Oh, I see, yes, yeah. I know roughly where it is now. Then. Yeah. You've obviously got some budding ro roars on the call tonight. <laughs> <Simon>. <laughs> <I'm not buddy. laughs> you may have competition for Paris. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank, thank you very much for doing that. I think it's, um, and good luck with your training and good luck, uh, obviously, for Paris and the next, your next games is the world's, is the world's the next? competition yeah we'll have uh, probably a world cup yeah yeah and uh, keep talking about your sunday times yeah. with everyone because otherwise you won't get votes but we will publicize and try and get everyone to um to vote for you and good luck yeah. with that we, yeah thank you we are up against the lionesses so we um we have some quite <laughs> stiff competition <laughs> <laughs> you have Never to. Heard of it. <laughs> well, that's first, second, and third. So yes. <laughs> competition has not been a problem with you in the past. I don't think. Yeah, either. true. Well, thank you very much oh. for having me. <laughs> okay, right, our November speaker is going to be Julie Marson, who's the member of Parliament for Stortford and Hartford. There should be some interesting comments. I, I haven't heard whether she's got a position or not in this new, new government today. And she'll get, definitely give us some good insights into, into government and, and the last month. So can I just invite you all to raise your glasses and toast the King Rotary and the people of Ukraine. So thank you all and good night. Thank you, Gordon. Yes. Gordon. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you, Ron.